Good Friday morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome on into the Brass Ring Media flagship podcast. It's Friday, November 3rd, 2023. What's going on? I am Zach Haydorn. Great to be here. Glad you guys are here with me. Um, as you'll see, I'm all by myself this week. Uh, Tyler, uh, normally my partner in crime here, had to uh, handle some personal uh, some personal stuff and uh, will not be on the show this week. But I'm here. We're talking wrestling. We have a big weekend ahead with some uh, some wild wrestling stuff and uh, and a really big event um, in uh, in uh, in Saudi Arabia of all places for for Crown Jewel. And so we got a lot of business to take care of today on the show, um, and we will get to that in one minute. Once again, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining the show. The chat is up and running. Tracy's in there. Hello, Tracy. Happy Friday to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a Brass Ring Media member. We certainly appreciate it. Um, this is the Brass Ring Media flagship podcast, the weekly free podcast right here on YouTube. We go live on Friday, late mornings, um, to talk all the news of the week in wrestling, to preview big shows, take your questions, and just hang out shoot the breeze about professional wrestling uh, for a while. Um, we also are available on all your podcast feeds. This exact show, if you can't catch us live or don't like <laughs> consuming YouTube content, this exact show is available in podcast form immediately after we go off the air here. So wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us um, and we will be there. The exact same show, but in an audio only uh, audio only format. I hope you're taking advantage of all the free Brass Ring Media content out there. This show, we've got free content going up um, on our YouTube channel outside of the, the podcast on a regular basis. Check that out. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube and also subscribe to our Substack newsletter. That has been um, a really fun way to analyze wrestling and we get some really cool feedback from our from our readers we have a free version of that and we've got a paid version of that and you can get a host of uh written brass free media content from myself from tyler and others um by just subscribing for free to brass ring media on substack and then of course of course of course of course you can become a brass ring media member like tracy like others by uh finding us on patreon patreon.com backslash brass ring media um we're a new endeavor we're a new little shop here for pro wrestling um and we'd appreciate your support we'd appreciate you trying us out we have uh, a busy busy weekend ahead with crown jewel so as a brass ring media member you get full access to all content and that includes ad free versions of this show that includes complete access to all the newsletter content on substack that gets you a free weekly podcast, members only podcast, um, as well as all pay-per-view reviews um, are available to our uh, Brass Ring Media members. And we, of course, will be doing one this weekend uh, for WWE Crown Jewel. All of that and a lot more, $4 is the asking price. We will make sure to earn your business um, and make sure you get the most value, the biggest bang for your buck. Um, and we certainly would appreciate it. So give us a shot. Patreon.com backslash Brass Ring Media. Cool? All right. With the propers and with the business taken care of, let's get into some uh, let's get into some topics. And I want to start. We're going to preview uh, WWE Crown Jewel on this show for sure. Um, and we're going to do that here in a minute. But I want to start the show today with um, – with a comment from from one of our Brass Ring Media members on our Discord channel, which is a, a Discord world, if you will, to talk about wrestling. You get access to that as a Brass Ring Media member. Um, it's really a fun group, you guys. Like it's it's so fun to talk wrestling with those folks. Um, everybody is opinionated, which is great, but respectful, which is equally, if not more, <laughs> great than being opinionated. But we have a blast shooting the breeze about wrestling live during shows, after the fact, throughout the week. Um, join that world. If you don't want to talk wrestling on Twitter. This is your this is your chance. But this comes this question comes from Sean, which is one of our uh, one of our members. He says, "Please talk about Sheeta versus the Sheeta versus Willow match from AEW Dynamite and the angle afterwards." I thought the match as a whole was very slow and sloppy, and the angle afterward didn't make any sense to me at all. And I also think that Sheeta's reign as champion has been so so meaningless. So this is a good uh, a good way to start the show. I 
I and Sean will definitely I'm going to hit that exact question in a second, but I want to talk high level AEW uh, here for a second. I thought that the that AEW this week had some really strong moments in it. I thought the opening kind of segment and then the opening match was one of the best opening segments and opening matches that that AEW has done in a long, long time. Like setting the table the way that they did, not with like a kind of like a, you know, overly produced vignette, but it was awesome to see AEW out of the gate on Dynamite on their biggest show of the year set up for the viewer. What is the most important thing that's going to happen on the show this week? And who's the biggest star? And what's the biggest storyline? And they did that. Tony Khan did that with the way he opened the show. He framed what MJF is doing as a major deal. He framed the match on Saturday night that a lot of people admittedly on his end, he would say, didn't see because, you know, viewership wasn't very, very strong. And it was a Saturday night and it was collision. Like, but they recapped that. So not only did people get caught up on what happened, but... They're, I think, you know, they, they did a good job planting a little bit of FOMO with everybody <laughs> being like, hey, you're, you don't want to, you can't miss out on this Saturday night collision stuff. Like it matters. It's important. Um, and, and then like they actually went into the story and actually went into what happened, why it matters and how it's going to continue to play out storyline wise on Dynamite. That framed up the story in a big deal. And then MJF through all of that because he is the featured act and he is the world champion and he is the guy that a lot of the company is built around right now is placed prominently at the top of the show where if you haven't watched a lick of dynamite before you knew starting the show that MJF is a major, major star. They told you that with how he was featured. So I really, really liked um, that opening the opening montage to dynamite. I hope they continue to do that. I hope they continue to frame things that way. Um, Cause right out of the gate, it just, it can tell your audience what's important and what's not. And it's a tool that AEW just has not used at their disposal really since their inception. They have not been, not been good about that. Um, but needless to say, uh, they were uh, on this night. I really liked what they did with Christian and with edge this week on the show. Um, I thought Edge had one of his better had one of his better nights. I th- thought he was fired up. I thought he made a lot of sense. I thought that he it really came across to him when he was deciding whether or not he was going to fight Christian as part of the the trios team with with Sting and Darby Allen. That it was emotional for him. That I thought he sold the fact that it hurt him to have to make the decision that he was going to make and fight his best friend, but one that he was absolutely committed to making because Christian is being such an a-hole for lack of a better word. And so as to not swear on the, on, on the free channel, like I thought that was really well done. I thought he showed that emotion, he showed some range. Um, and ultimately all of that made that match a hell of a lot more intriguing um, than it was a week ago. And then it would have been without that segment. So I liked those two things very much. Um, I liked the young bucks. Ultimately, I liked them. Uh, it's a low bar to clear for them. Like, sorry to say, you know, so like if they do anything of note, that's not like walk out there and have a good match. I think that that's noteworthy and newsworthy, <laughs> but it happened this week. And so I think it's worth noting, like there was some character development there. There was some, um, you know, some fire from Matt Jackson for about losing the ROH six-man tag titles like do I really think that that matters all that much no I think it's better for them not to have those titles but you still want to show that losing matters to them and losing the titles matters to them and they did that they gave the young bucks some context they gave them some personality like I mean god darn how long has it been since we've seen the young bucks involved in something like in something like real that isn't just a good match. This was good. And I like how he was. they were able to weave into what's going on with Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho. I don't know that they need to go too far into like dissension land with the elite. We've kind of, we've been there 
done that with that story. Like we we're there. We've already seen it. We've seen them break up. We've seen them come together. <laughs> now they can just be together. They should just, just be together and they can do their own things, but just be together, be a group that gets along and, and go. That's what I prefer. But ultimately I want to see the young bucks positioned in a prominent way. And in order to do that on weekly episodic television, you got to have story. You got to have character. I thought the young bucks found a little bit of that this week. So those are the three things that I, <clears throat> that I like most. I, I could have done without MJF hunting around, you know, for, for, uh, um, tag team partners when you were just going to go with like the acclaimed anyway, I think, you know, MJF's the champion. He's the babyface champion. Like he should have a pick of the litter as far as other baby faces go to be on his team. And, you know, I, I don't think they did a good job telling that story holistically like i thought that like mjf kind of came across as a loser after he ended up having to tag with the team that he didn't want to tag with for two straight hours i think if you were going to go that route just just go there get there quicker make people interested in him tagging with those guys and not make it seem like a consolation prize that he was which is how which is how i took it um and you know the acclaim is just such a silly act right now, and and MJF is beyond that. It's beyond silliness with Max Caster and Anthony Bowens. He just he is, and he should be. So I didn't love that. Um, and then to Sean's question, the whole deal with uh, with Sheeta and with Willow, and again with Julia Hart and 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 that and that whole group, like. The women's division in AEW is having a very, very tough time right now. I, I really think it is disorganized at best and then just a complete and utter mess <laughs> at worst. You know, you've got the the world championship on Hikaru Shida. And once again, once again, the world champion isn't like the most prominent star on the show and fundamentally i think that's a problem like especially when you're trying to create a baseline for a division right and you're trying to make that division matter you have to have your world champion at the top of the food chain you just have to and that's just not the case right now that's not where she is at and so i think that really waters down her title run and waters down the audience's perception of her as champion because you have all these other things happening. You've got the Willow storyline going on. You've got um, Julia Hart coming back and sky blue. And you've got that, that uh, dynamic between the two of them and what's going to happen there. Um, and then really the big kind of elephant in the room is Tony storm. She is like by far and away, like the most over talent on the women's roster. And She's got a gimmick that is really, really fun to watch. And it's fun to see her kind of dive into that on, on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, but admittedly, when she does so, I mean, she attracts all attention. She pulls – she's so dynamic and she's so compelling as a character. And what she's doing is so unique and interesting that, that – she kind of just sucks up all the attention from everybody else. Like she's so much of a bigger star than others on the show that it's hard for Sheeta to compete with her in terms of being like cool and notable and somebody that the audience should care about. So I, I just, I just, I look at that. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Yes. Go drive, go drive, Sean, drive, drive, drive. That is most important. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. The one thing I'll say is that Sheeta versus Abaddon match was even worse. Yeah, it was not, that was not a good match uh, at all. Um, Thank you, Sean, for, for watching. And thanks for being here. Thanks for supporting the show. The, so to me, and I've been saying this a long time about the women's division and about AEW in general. But to me, you got to like align that division the way that A, you want it to be aligned. 
but B, in a way that makes the most sense and with the top star holding the world title. It has to be that way. You have to reset the table. You can't have an act like Tony Storm just completely take over the show in terms of popularity, in terms of interest, in terms of news, and hope and believe that Sheeta can still be champion in that scenario. It'd be like, this is like a drastic example. So like, you know, you can can kind of uh, roll your eyes a little bit, but I use it more to articulate my point rather than make a comparison. If you had in the Attitude Era, Stone Cold Steve Austin doing the Austin versus McMahon thing, and you had the world championship somewhere else in the company, anywhere else, even if it was on a big star, like, you know, like Mankind at the time. Let's just say they put the title on Mankind and Mankind was the champion, you know, during Austin versus McMahon. There's no way that you can frame Mankind as like a viable top star champion in that environment because everything he does is overshadowed by Steve Austin. Like the Steve Austin stuff needed the title because he's the top star. He's the top guy. And you start there and then you align the company and the division from there. I think the men's side, Tony Khan's got it figured out for better or for worse. At least he had it figured out. (laughs) MJF, biggest star at the top, has the world title. And has had it for over or close to a year now. We can talk about whether or not he should keep it. We will, as full gear (laughs) looms closer. But the women's division has never had that. It's never had that type of that type of alignment. Maybe for like a little while there when Britt Baker was the champion. But even when Britt Baker was the champion, you had Jade Cargill on the show. You had her as TBS champion, and she was a hugely protected star, somebody that commanded a lot of attention. And so even in that world, you know, Britt didn't stand out heads above the rest. Tony Khan needs to look at that here. And what it means, what it means to me is you put the title on Tony Storm, (laughs) you know, you run with your hot act, but then that's it for a while. You put her out there, you give her the title and you set up heels for her to work with. Maybe that's Julia Hart. Maybe that's Willow Nightingale. We'll get to her in a second. You know, maybe that's a way to get her, you know, on the heel side of the ledger and, you know, fighting for the world title in a main event type of way. Whatever it is, but you start there. Get that title on your biggest star. And maybe you bring Britt Baker back. Where the heck has she been? These top talents in AEW, they're they're not on the show. So it's like, bring her back. Bring her back as a heel. Do a program with her and and, and that Tony Storm. There there could be some really good heat there, I think. You know, you could have Britt Baker just kind of run Tony Storm down with because of the crazy gimmick that she has and the crazy character and how she's lost her mind. And I think there's some sympathy there for, for, for Tony Storm. And I think fans would buy it. But you can only do that if you put that title on the most important thing that's happening in the division. And I think, and maybe they will. Look, maybe they will. They're they're going to have the match, Sheeta versus Tony Storm for the title. That's happening at full gear. So that could be in in the cards. So fingers crossed that they do that. But when they do that, and if they do that, they got to stick with it. Tony Storm should be the top woman in that company for at least a year. And then reassess. That makes the most sense. Now, as far as Willow Nightingale goes, yeah, she was somebody, and 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 there's a lot of people like this in AEW. Lots. She was somebody that was on on the rise. She had a really strong summer, you know, from a from a wrestling perspective. She was in some big matches. She was the New Japan Strong Women's Champion. She was wrestling Sasha Banks or Mercedes Monet. So she, I mean, she had a lot of big moments and the fans seemed to be behind her or at least like on their way to being behind her. They were investing. They were trying to decide whether or not Willow Nightingale was somebody that they should invest in. 
And she was on her way. And then the momentum was kind of just halted, just stopped altogether. That happens too often in AEW. Orange Cassidy is another really good example of that. He has a great summer of amazing title matches. And he has a major main event international championship match against John Moxley where he loses but gets over to a higher level in losing. And then he goes and starts teaming with Hook. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? That's not good booking. And neither has it been with Willa Nightingale. I think she's been a victim of the book. She hasn't got the attention that she needs to capitalize on the motive. Uh, on the momentum that she generated. And so she kind of just fizzled away and fizzled away, you know, not gone, but she no longer has the momentum that she had. And therefore you either have to decide, okay, are we going to try to jumpstart this thing again some way, or are we just going to let it go and and move on? And I think they're going to, it sounds like they're going to try to jumpstart this with Willow Nightingale being linked up with, with Julia Hart. That's my prediction. This week on Dynamite, Sky Blue was presented as, okay, I'm going to join Julia Hart. I've got the black eye makeup. Like, it's going to happen. That's that's the heel turn. And it didn't happen. Instead, Sky Blue misted Julia Hart herself and then, you know, went on her own way. Julia Hart, angry at Sky Blue. That'll be a match. I didn't like that angle. I thought that angle was a swing and a miss. Um, it didn't seem like the crowd bought it. It didn't seem like like anybody really kind of cared whether or not Sky Blue joined her, joined Julia Hart or not. Like I don't think it was this big, you know, reveal of oh my god, she's not going to join when when that happened. And then on top of that, on top of that. Man, Sky Blue just totally missed Julia Hart with that, with the mist. Like, whatever that was, you know, she didn't hit her in the face with it. And yikes, that's, that's a, that's a miss. That's a, that's a, that's a big, big miss. So I didn't like that angle. I didn't like that angle either. Um, Yes, thanks very much. We will be uh, jumping into our Crown Jewel preview here in a minute. I appreciate that. And thanks for joining the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, yeah, so AEW has some issues. We'll be talking more about AEW on this week's member-only episode of Brass Ring Media. You can become a Brass Ring Media member right now. Uh, find us on Patreon, patreon.com backslash Brass Ring Media. Uh, but let's do it. Let's preview WWE Crown Jewel uh, this Saturday, so uh, tomorrow, as we record this here on Friday, um, on Friday, on Friday late morning. Uh, we're about 24 hours away from uh, from Crown Jewel, and it's a big event. It's a big show. And I think, like, you know, for a long time, the WWE Crown Jewel events did not sit within, like, the cadence of regular WWE programming. Like, in some instances, you had that company booking a crown jewel show while they were booking another pay-per-view and it was really confusing and really messy and it made these crown jewel saudi arabia events not must see not important easy to skip because they happen but they're really like glorified house shows is, is what they were and you know i think on one hand it's for sure smart that they've brought that show into like the month the the annual calendar of wwe where you know it's going to happen in february and it's going to happen in um it's going to happen in november late october and you know that's part of it and if you're going to follow wwe programming and you're going to follow wwe storylines they're going to continue to happen on this show i think that's the only way to do it where it makes sense where it doesn't like you know annoy your viewers that we have to follow you have to follow two sets of storylines at the same time that really was was hard and nearly impossible for for wwe to thread that um through its television shows and frankly it was just bothersome at least for me it's like pick book one show like come on do that we don't need to see a glorified house show on pay-per-view like make it make it make it matter within the regular cadence and so and that's what you have now the downside of that is 
you've got, you know, major WWE storylines playing out in Saudi Arabia. And I, I, I don't think you can analyze this show and, and we're not, I'm not going to harp on it here, but I just want to call it out that this is not, this is not, you know, a regime that you should be wanting to do business with. If you're WWE, it's, I think that there, it's, it's clouded ethically. Um, they go there for, to make money. And yes, I think they do, you know, kind of, uh, their their mission if you talk to somebody in wwe is hey we're, we're, we're changing things we're helping their, their culture you know fans get to get to see us over there and that's all there for sure and that's all good for sure but it's also not why wwe goes they go because they get paid obscene obscene fees for doing so um and uh, as wade keller talked about this week out of proportion fees for their for their for their product going over there um and you know we're what they started this show in 2018 so we are five years into the into the agreement and um you know i think i think narrative around the ethics of wwe going to saudi arabia has cooled just because it's been so normal it's been so you know part of their calendar and so and that's why i said it's a double-edged sword because i think in one hand it's good because like you 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 know it's easy to follow it's part of the year boom but it also normalizes the move it also normalizes what it means for the company to go to saudi arabia to put the shows on and you know i just think it's important to call that out given the circumstances um and and yeah like you know it is what it is. They're go they're going there. Um, we are going to cover the show here, um, but I also just want to make sure to talk about it, you know, in a with a clear lens as well as to what it means and whether or not WWE w, WWE excuse me should be should be going there. So uh, thanks for letting me do that hat tip. Uh, let's go. Yeah, that, right. Tracy hit the nail on the head. That was the word I was looking for. They're, they are a propaganda machine when they do this show. There are residual benefits, but, you know, the main reason is that they do it is for money. And Saudi Arabia uses these shows to be propaganda machines for, for, for the country. That's reality. That's reality. So as for good of a, as good of a card, I think this is, um, you know, that is the truth behind it. And it's, uh, it's important to call that out. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. With that said, let's start reviewing the show and previewing the show. We'll start off with the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Seth Rollins defending his title against Drew McIntyre. This has been one of the more compelling storylines on all of WWE TV in the last six weeks. And I don't, and I don't necessarily mean WWE and um like 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 all of WWE. I mean like Monday Night Raw in general. Like it is. A strong story, not just because of Seth, although Seth has played his part, but really the whole thing is resting on the shoulders of Drew McIntyre and the intrigue that he has built as a challenger for this world title and the things that he's been able to say out loud. Like Drew had a whole video package this week on Raw about the pandemic, about being the guy in the pandemic that won and had the crowning moment of his career in front of nobody and what that meant and how hard that was. And then he got to speak about how when he got his opportunity in front of fans, the bloodline screwed him over and, and he lost his opportunity. Like, I think it's really nice to see him address that as like the alpha competitor babyface that he, at least that he is right now <laughs> that could change, of course, but but right now, it like, why wouldn't you call that out? That would be on my mind. You know, if I were him and I had this big moment coming and then everything gets shut down and the whole moment changes and it happens at a time where really like, yeah, people were paying attention to wrestling, but there was so much else going on that was significantly more serious, like people keeping their jobs and finding childcare and what do you do with work and how do you work from home and like, all of this just stress of trying to stay healthy during the pandemic. Like 
Drew as champion just wasn't high on the priority list of things that people cared about at that time. And he did a nice job and he held down the company and he did all that. And now he's talking about it. And I think it really makes Drew come across as authentic and real and something that you can invest in as a fan watching. And so I like how they've set the table on that. I like how they set the table on a when I'm in control of my narrative, when it's when it's me, I win and I win big championships. And the only reason I haven't so far is because of that pesky bloodline. And then you have Seth Rollins on the other side of things, running Drew back down with that, also in a very, very real way. You know, saying real responses to him like, hey, Drew, listen, man, yeah, you had a tough go during the pandemic, but so did I. And so did everybody else in the whole world in their own way. Stop crying about it. Like, and I think that's what, like, an, I wrote about this uh, over on scscoops.com. You can check out my work there um, on a regular basis if you haven't. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> but, you know, that's what, like, an alpha athlete would say. I, you know, if, if Michael Jordan, you know, if you were, if you went up to Michael Jordan and you gave him some kind of, you know, excuse as to why you didn't beat him in a game or in its NBA finals, right? Like, I don't think he's not going to be, he's not going to feel sorry for you. You know, I think he would recognize that. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. You kind of got screwed, but Hey, you know, overcome, you know, overcome and win. I did. And I think that was kind of Seth's attitude here. It's like, yeah, yeah, you did. I've, but I've been screwed over a lot of times too. And I've faced challenges and I've had hills to overcome and I've, you know, had to go through a pandemic too. Like I think Drew's or excuse me, Seth's response to Drew was very, reasonable and i think that colliding head-on in a match is going to be really fun to see happen and i think it's because because what you've set up is two authentic characters just trying to become the best and trying to become champion and like the essence of that i think is very effective in professional wrestling now the added layer to that is drew mcintyre has shown some heel tendencies and I do think in the end that this match is going to directly lead to a Drew McIntyre heel turn. Like they pretty much called it out straight away where, you know, where Drew said basically all the, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically all the losses that I've had, the key losses aren't really my fault. They're not on me. And as true as that is, I think you're going to see the tables turn on that in this match where it's going to be his fault. Either he makes a miscalculation in the match or maybe he gets disqualified or, you know, something, something to the end where it is 100% his fault. And then you see the fallout of that play out leading to the heel turn. It may, the full heel turn may not take place at crown jewel, but I do think we're going to get a major chapter here in the future of Drew McIntyre, and it's going to be rooted in losing this match. So I'm taking Seth Rollins here. I, I, it's too soon to, to take the belt off of him. I think he's been really good with the title, um, but I think the the story plays better if Drew doesn't win the title on, on this night. You know, this is a match I think you can go back to. I think you can have, you know, a rematch at Survivor Series, you know, in Chicago. And if you want to do a title switch then with Drew as a heel, great, you can do that. Um, but I think you have to have this chapter first where it's Drew's own undoing or own doing <laughs> that undoes him. Um, that is necessary here to really complete that heel turn. So I like this match a lot. I think it's going to be one of the best matches on the show. Um, I'm taking Seth Rollins. Uh, but I think while Seth Rollins wins the title, I think it's going to be – the story mainly is going to be about Drew McIntyre, um, Drew McIntyre coming out of it. All right, let's uh, let's go to Io Sky versus Bianca Belair. Uh, you know, eh, okay. I think this is kind of a story that that has written itself. Like this is low hanging fruit storytelling for WWE. Bianca Belair won the championship at SummerSlam, and instantly Io Sky <laughs> cashed in her money in the bank beat Bianca Belair, is the champion, and there we go. This is why they're wrestling, <laughs> right? And, and like, it's not a bad. It's not all bad. Like, it's just there's not a lot of depth there. And I think that there's an issue with EO Sky right now. You know, 
people and the audiences, my sense is that they don't want to boo EO Sky. And so she just is kind of a likable act. And the reason they boo her is she's out alongside Bailey and she's booked against other baby faces. But I think she's really in a tough spot opposite Bianca Belair because I think the audience is more invested in EO Sky as a baby face, but like super ultra invested in Bianca Belair as a baby face. So I think Belair is going to just completely overshadow and overwhelm EO Sky um, in this. And that's not to say they, they can't have a good match. I think they, they probably will have a good match, but I think EO Sky very much gets overshadowed here. And that's why I'm taking Bianca to win the, win the title. I, you know, EO Sky was, ah, man, what, how do I, how do I try to think of a, like a, like a good champion. She kind of was like, you don't remember when CM Punk was the world champion back when he cashed in his money in the bank. I don't know. A lot of years ago now, 2009, maybe 2008, like, this kind of reign for EO was a lot like that, where it's like you have a world title, but you're nowhere near the top act on the show. You're not in main events. You're not like you're featured because you have the belt, but you're not like, you know, the most important talent in the women's division, even though you're champion. And th- she's been in that that category and she won the world title because she was the money in the bank winner. And, you know, you need they needed to do something with that. I don't think they wanted to define her down with a loss in her money in the bank opportunity. But you just she's just not she's not that she's not that person. She's not that star right now. And she's had her time with the title. And now it's time, I think, get going into the fall and going into the Royal Rumble season. And as you get ready for WrestleMania, um, I think you want to have like that title on just like an AEW. Just like in AEW, same thing. You want that title on the major star that you have on the show. And in that instance, this that's that's Bianca Belair. And I think um, that's what you'll see. Um, that's what you'll see happen here. So I predict Bianca Belair as your new WWE Women's Champion. All right, moving right along. We've got John Cena. Oh, boy. John Cena versus Solo Sokoa. Grudge match. Man, I'll, I'll just be frank with you guys, all right? You know me. I'm honest. This match worries me. This match really worries me. Solo Sokoa has so much upside. So much upside. He is a protected star. I think he's got some mystery behind him. Um, he doesn't say much, but he has a presence. And there's equity there. I think there's equity in like Solo Sokoa eventually having his like Batista thumbs down moment on Triple H. And in this case, it'll be on Roman Reigns. But the story here (laughs) seems to be that John Cena is going after a win because he hasn't had a win in over 2000 days. So I just don't see John Cena putting that out there and then losing another match. Like that's not really <laughs> that's not really like the Cena way. And it's not really like WWE's storytelling way either. They you know, they typically don't throw out red herrings like that. Usually that means it's part of the story and if they finish that story here, sorry Cody for taking your catchphrase, John Cena wins, which means John Cena is beating Solo Sokoa. And I got ish, I take issue with that. Like Solo, I mean, Austin Theory beat John Cena. And now Solo is going to lose? I mean, Solo is significantly more important right now on WWE television than Austin Theory. Yet he's the guy that's kind of stuck in there doing the job. Not, Not a good call. Like I would be in a situation if it were me where, you know, yeah, no, John. You're doing the job here too. <laughs> You're leaving. You know, this is one of John Cena's final final appearances, probably his final match, you know, and in this current run in WWE. And yeah, I think he should be going out losing, especially to this guy. Like if this was Grayson Waller, or if it was Austin Theory again, or you know, somebody else low on the card, even like Jimmy Uso. If this was a Jimmy Uso singles match, I think John Cena could win. You know, 
Jimmy's pretty Teflon. But the fact that it's solo Sokoa rose me the wrong way. Now, Sokoa is going to gain a lot from, from, from wrestling John Cena. Like, that's a notable spot. But to lose to him, like, stunts his momentum. I think. And I just don't think you want to do that. If you know and seen some of Solo's work, he's a strong character. He's a strong performer. I mean, he was a shining guy in the weird NXT 2.0 era, but Solo Sokoa can talk. He doesn't get a lot of reps on the microphone these days, but that guy can cut a promo. He, he can, he can sell matches. He's intense. He's got an intensity behind him. And um, I think part of why that stands out right now is the presence that he has because he's kind of like an unstoppable force. And now you're going to lose that because he's going to lose to John Cena. I'm taking Cena. I don't like it. And hit myself over the head. It's not good, <laughs> but it is what it'll be. Cena over Solo Scar. Damian Priest. Versus Cody Rhodes. Interesting match here. Um, the the This is Cody Rhodes written, written all over it. You know, he's going to get the win. Uh, I, I have no reason to believe at this point that Damian Priest is going to win this match. Nor should he. Nor should he. Cody Rhodes is the guy that's being protected and the guy that's going to be in line for a major, major title match against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. Like, all indications and in reporting points to that being where WWE is going with him. And if that's the case, he, he can't be losing matches like this. Sorry. He just can't. So what else do you do? And I thought, I thought Priest and Rhodes have had some good chemistry together in the build. I thought um, Cody had a really nice fiery baby face promo this week um, on the show where, you know, he, he talked about winning and talked about how beating Damian Priest is part of his story and how you can't beat him down because he's going to get right back up. And it's, you know, it's it's A to B, simple babyface stuff, but it works in the right situation. And it's been working here. Um, I also like this match for as definitive as I think it's going to be in terms of Cody Rhodes winning. Like, it elevates Damian Priest because I think it shows your the audience and the fans that Priest and Rhodes are like on similar levels. Like they're both in a spot where they want to be competing for world titles. And so they're going to compete against each other to hopefully elevate themselves even more. Like I think the match helps bring Damian Priest up to Cody Rhodes' level and not the other way around. And that's exactly how you want this to go. You want people to perceive Priest more so on Cody's level than the other way around. Um, and I think that this is this has done that. So the match to me is going to be Cody all the way. I think it's a simple finish. I think it's Cody wins. I don't know that he has to win clean, though. You know, I think this could be a situation where J.D. McDonough, you know, gets involved um, or Judgment Day or even Rhea Ripley. Like, much like Drew McIntyre, where Seth's going to be the winner in that match, but Drew's going to have the story coming out of it. Same thing here. I think Cody wins, but I think that storyline of dissension in the Judgment Day gets another chapter, you know, which gives Damian Priest something to do. So that's how I think this rolls out. Real quick on Damian Priest, what a year that guy's had. I mean, like, it wasn't so long ago that he was, you know, kind of in the background of a, you know, Bad Bunny Miz thing. But he showed something this year. I think he found like the gear that works for him. I think working with bad bunny in that match in Puerto Rico really helped. I think that changed the tone around, around him and not just as like a worker, but as, Whoa, this guy's a, this guy's a big star. Like let's pay attention to him. Um, I think that worked to that end in a, in a very, in a very big way. So priest has had a great, has had a great year. And I, I don't know what they do about that money in the bank briefcase. Like they have to get their way around that. But I, and, and may, hey, maybe he, maybe, maybe he cashes in this week, you know, <laughs> and uh, kind of immediately kind of shakes off the Cody Lowe's Rhodes loss. That's a one way to do that. You know, you lose to Cody Rhodes and later in the show you cash in. So people aren't thinking about the loss, but they're thinking about you, you know, cashing in for the world title. Maybe that's the route they go. Either way, I think this match is one that, uh, 
is good. It's effective, but one that Cody takes. Like it's his time to win. He needs to get he needs to get the wins behind him as he heads into what is going to be, in my opinion, the biggest year of his of his career. Let's keep it rolling. Rey Mysterio versus Logan Paul. Oh my gosh, I can't wait for this. <laughs> Oh, and I don't want to be saying that, folks. I don't want to be saying that. But Logan Paul is a damn good professional wrestler. There are just no other ways to put that these days. You know, I know it's going to induce some eye rolls. I apologize. (laughs) I really do. But good pro wrestlers can come from a lot of different places. And if you can connect with your audience, that is the most important thing. I think any pro wrestler would tell you that. That that connection is key, more so than anything else. And Logan Paul has that. And not only does he have it, but he know he's learning and figuring out quickly how to manipulate that and how to drive like bigger negative reactions. Um, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. And then Crown Jewel, he's got the perfect baby face to play off of in Rey Mysterio. Rey can lay on the thin- sympathy huge with Logan Paul. Logan Paul can work off of that sympathy all match long. Like this can be a very simple match from a formula perspective. Like go in there, get heat on Ray, <laughs> and then Ray makes the comeback. But that, that's all it needs to be. I think Ray is a good enough babyface and a strong enough performer as a good guy that you know you can carry Logan Paul to something real easy. Um, and something that matters and something that fans will will get behind. And I think that's what we're going to see here. Now, I think we're going to get more bells and whistles because that's what Logan Paul does. Like, he can do some fun top row moves. He can do some crazy social media stunt in the match. Um, I'm higher on that than other people because that's because that's that's the character. But that's all on the table. And I think the two of them are just going to be able to work really well together. Um, I hope they get a lot of time. Like, I hope they get time to, to do their thing. Um, just just because I think it's 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 worth it. Um, Logan Paul is a really great asset for that company. And, you know, working with working with Rey Mysterio is going to is going to is going to help his game out. Um, and I think that audience is going to be very interested um, in the match in the match itself. So in terms of who wins, it's time for Logan Paul to hold a title in, in WWE. And I think him holding it, holding the United States Championship and winning it off Ray like does two things. One, it instantly puts him in the full on heel camp. Hey, we hate you, Logan Paul, because not only are you around, but you're beating like one of our favorites in, in uh, excuse me, in Rey Mysterio. And you're also holding a title. You, Logan Paul, are holding one of our prestigious titles in the U.S. title. Like, no, we cannot have that. And so I think they want that reaction. I also think that they want to set up Logan Paul's stuff for the future. What's he going to do at Royal Rumble? What's he going to do at WrestleMania? Royal Rumble, he's probably going to be in the Rumble, right? I think that's reasonable. Um, But the story you want, inevitably, is someone chasing Logan Paul and beating him for that title. And LA Knight seems like the perfect person for that. We'll get to the previewing uh, LA Knight versus Roman Reigns here in a second. But, you know, LA Knight, I don't think he's going to win the world title from Roman Reigns. But you still want him to be a prominent part of the show every week. I mean, he sells the most merchandise right now. Like, he's a t- he's top guy. Um, who knows how long that will last? I don't know. Because you don't know, I don't know whether it's a good idea to pull the trigger on him over Roman. Especially with the Cody story, like, in the background. But why can't you pull the trigger on him beating Logan Paul? at WrestleMania and winning the United States title. That seems like a really strong position for him for LA Knight on the biggest show of the year. And in order to do that, you have to have that, that title on, on, on somebody like Logan Paul. And I think Logan Paul is so much of a heel that you don't, you're not risking people turning on LA Knight. You're not risking like that act, like losing momentum going into WrestleMania. Cause it doesn't matter. Like Logan Paul's there. Huh, he's there to, inject more heat into what into what's going on that's that's what he can do and i think la knight's gonna be the benefactor of that but he needs the title to do so so i'm taking logan paul as your new wwe united states champion all right we got a fatal five way 
for the WWE Women's World Championship. Rhea Ripley defending against Nia Jax, against Raquel Rodriguez, against Shayna Baszler, and against Zoe Stark. The story here is rooted in madness and pandemonium. <laughs> That's how we got here. And, like, I am not a huge fan of, like, multiple women. Well, not just women's matches, but multiple person matches. Like, I'm not really a huge fan of triple threats. Not a huge fan of fatal four ways. I think it's usually like a, a crutch for mm, crap. We don't have anybody ready <laughs> to wrestle for the world title. So let's just throw five people together. And that means it's crazy fun. And there's all these contenders. And, and that just doesn't do much for me. I give WWE credit in this case, though, of making the fatal five way make sense. Like by by writing a story in which pandemonium at the top of the raw women's division was a prominent feature week in and week out for a bunch of weeks. Like you had brawls with all of these women, Nia Jax involved in the middle of a lot of them. And so it was totally conceivable for you to think, okay, Adam Pierce, what, what, what can he do here to like make this all better? Okay. Let's just have a match. You guys want to fight? You guys want to do this? Okay, fine. You're all getting in there at the same time and you battle it out and whoever wins walks out as champion. Like that is in line with the story that they told. And so that's why I give, you know, this match stipulation and the fatal five way um, idea a thumbs up. You know, they gave it, they gave it time to breathe. They gave it context. They made it matter. And I think that's really, really important. Ultimately, I think it's designed for Rhea Ripley. I think Rhea Ripley, this is like going to be her match. I like, I don't know that I see her. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I do. I mean, I think I see her just like essentially taking out everybody. Like it's not an elimination match, so she's not going to pin everybody. But my, my thought here is like you use this match to make her because no one else on the roster is really, or in that match is really a threat at this, at this point. Right. I mean, you've got Raquel Rodriguez, middle of the card, Shayna Baszler, middle of the card, Zoe Stark, middle of the card, and Nia Jax, middle of the card, if that. Like, it's it's not like you have, like, a Becky Lynch in this match or a, real, uh, or a you know, Charlotte Flair in this match. Like, it's Rhea and, like, the mid-card of the women's division on, on, uh, on Monday Night Raw. And so, with that said, I think Rhea just rolls right through all these guys, all these women. I think she, like... I think she dominates. I think she just owns her spot. And I think she comes out victorious in a very, very strong way. Now, th th that, like, she's teetering on the edge of, like, a baby face turn. I mean, fans really want to cheer for her right now. And I'm glad that WWE is like, pumped the brakes on actually giving them that. Because I don't think they're ready for that yet. I think you still want to do Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley. With Ripley as a heel and with Dominic with her. So, you know, I, I think that like it's good that WWE is not leaning into positive reinforcement for Rhea Ripley. Um, but that said, if she has a performance like I'm outlining, it's you know she just looks cooler and cooler and cooler and more cool than everybody she's wrestling with. Ergo, that's you know she kind of is a babyface at that point. So they got to be careful with terms of how they book this. But because they did, and because of the business on the table for Rhea Ripley, this to me is a is a Ripley dominated match. She gets the win. She retains her championship. And last but not least, man, big match. Roman Reigns versus LA Knight for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. Uh, th this is going to be a fun one. I, I, I think that the audience is going to be fully behind LA Knight. And you're going to see a crazy LA Knight pop. And then I think you're going to see like a pretty standard Roman Reigns match. You know, where Reigns talks to, tonight, there's some false finishes. You get some um, situations where, you know, you know, you hit some big, some big mat moves, some unique moves, some high risk moves, perhaps. And in the end, Roman Reigns wins. Um, it would be so cool to see LA Knight beat Roman Reigns for the, for the world title. I mean, I think that that would just be fun to see. Much like it would have been fun to see Sami Zayn do it last year. Much like it would have been fun to see Kevin Owens do it last year. Drew McIntyre last year. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but that, that just because it's fun doesn't mean you should do it. And I think, 
you know, they're not going to do it here. Um, LA Knight has proven out to be a top star on SmackDown. The guy is selling merchandise like crazy. He held his own with Roman Reigns in the ring with the, during the contract signing segment. Um, he doesn't come across as somebody who's kind of overstepping his bounds in terms of popularity. He looks like he belongs in there with Roman Reigns. Um, and that's, that's what you want. That's what you want that person to do, especially when they're new to that main event scene. And he's done it. He's hit the ball out of the park. I think this is good for him. I think it's important for WWE to see that, you know, and go, okay, like this, this, this guy can be the real deal. Uh, that doesn't mean take the title off him though. Roman Reigns is too valuable. <laughs> um, he's valuable with the title. Um, you want him to hold that until you are in a full position where you can fully transfer all the equity that he has onto somebody else. And I, I just don't, for as much as I like the run that LA Knight is on, I just don't think he's the guy to assume all that equity at this point. I don't think he can get the most out of it long-term. Um, I don't think he can get the most out of it short-term either. So, um, you know, Roman's Roman. He's doing his thing, and he needs the belt to do so. So he retains here uh, and stands tall once again um, at Crown Jewel. Whew! There you have it, folks. That's it. That's it. I'm going to go record the members-only show. You can catch that on our Patreon, patreon.com backslash Brass Ring Media. Thanks to everybody who joined the show, Sean, Tracy, and everybody else that is in the comments tonight, uh, today. Excuse me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, please, folks, subscribe to our free stuff, you know, for sure. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our Substack page. Follow us on social media at Brass Ring underscore media. You can follow me on social media right there at Z Zach underscore Haydorn. Um, if you have trouble finding Brass Ring Media content, I will have it on my feed. Brass Ring Media will have it on their feed. Um, and then you can consume it, suck it in, tell some friends, <laughs> and help us grow uh, Help us grow this, this great, great community. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks to our members. Thanks to our listeners. Thanks to everybody who's listening on podcasts after the fact. I'm Zach. Tyler will be back next week. We will talk to you soon. Have a good weekend.